Yeah, I, I will just start with the first uh, question. What countries have we considered for demonstration reactor? Um, well, the Netherlands is one of the countries. Uh, we do also consider uh, Denmark, but the problem in Denmark is that currently we do not have any nuclear reactors. We used to have a couple of research reactors, but currently we do not have a nuclear reactor. And that means we do not currently have a, an approval agency. So that is, is a problem. Uh, and therefore we are of course considering other countries such as the Netherlands, US and Canada and, and other places. Um, we want to talk to a number of countries and understand uh, the, the different levels of dif difficulties that we might run into before we really select the country. Um, but yeah, uh, Netherlands is definitely one of the places where uh, we would want to look into this. I can just add a little bit onto that is that's also why we're looking to go for the first reactor being a one megawatt because the small module reactor um, uh, branch of this nuclear business is a little bit further along than the molten salt reactors and a lot of facilities are being outfitted to facilitate a test of small module reactors, especially in Idaho National Lab. They're funneling a lot of money into making that facility ready to test uh, smaller reactors. So that's one of the reasons that we're trying uh, to go for these one megawatt demo reactors. It's that the facilities are already there for testing them and a lot of the approvals are being worked out. Uh, as opposed to going directly for a commercial reactor. So another question is, uh, do you need highly enriched uranium to start an MSR thorium reactor? Uh, maybe I, I can take that. So, so at least you need some uh, fissile fuel to start a nuclear reactor. Uh, sometimes we call that Kickstarter fuel. Uh, and that can be uh, enriched uranium. There's a number of startup companies that wants to use enriched uranium for starting their reactor. We would prefer, if possible, to use uh, the actinides for, uh, that is taken out from spent nuclear fuel because we believe it's really important to show to the public that you can run and react on this material. Um, so that's our, our, hopefully, the primary choice. But it's not fully clear yet if we can get access to that. So if we cannot get, get access to plutonium in one form or the other, uh, then we could also use uh, enriched uranium. In most cases, you're not allowed to use in, uh, enriched uranium higher than 20% for these molten salt reactors, unless you are a military program in one of the original weapon states, then you could possibly get access to uh, highly enriched uranium, but that's, mm, it's unlikely to ever be commercially available. So it's not a good idea to go that direction. I should also mention that there, there is a company, Flyb Energy, that hopes to be able to start uh, their first reactor on uranium-233. There is a little bit of uranium-233 in the world, and um, it's in the US. There's rumors that there's also some in Russia, uh, but in Coming Atomics, we decided early on that it's not likely we, we will be able to get our hands on that. So that's not part of our plan. But it is uranium-233 is a really, really good uh, uh, fissile fuel. Another question is, is there a solution to extract the fission products during operation? Uh, yes. Um, there has been a number of research projects over the years, how to do that. They also did some of that back in Oak Ridge in the 60s. Uh, we have also done some research, but unfortunately we have not been uh, able to work directly on radioactive elements. So those, the research we've done into that has been uh, through simulations and through some lab work on stable elements of the same fission products. And what we want to do in Copenhagen Atomics is use a system where we uh, extract the all the volatile elements from the salt while the reactor is running. Many of you might know that there's two gases, xenon and krypton, that is in there, and also tritium is another gas. But there's actually also many of the fission products that in the fluoride form is uh, become volatile. And most of the fission products decay through uh, decay chains where they jump down in a decay chain that has uh, you know five, six, seven, eight, sometimes up to ten. Uh, different elements that it goes through in that decay chain. And at some point in that decay chain, it comes through some of these elements that are volatile uh, or in a gaseous form where you can get them out. And we have devised a system uh, with a, what we call vacuum nozzle spraying system, where we, through our simulations, have shown that 
it's likely that we can get 50% of the fission products uh, out of the salt without doing wet chemistry. Um, and we are, of course, very excited to, to try that. Uh, but we don't need to have that installed on the very first one megawatt demo reactor. So this is uh, in order to move fast forward uh, and because it's something we, we are not allowed to work on today, this is something that some work that we would do later on. There's a question about what is in the 40 foot container. The steam turbine looks to be outside or not. I can answer that one. Uh, so Copenhagen Atomics uh, is a company that's only focusing on the reactor and the molten salt technologies. That means that we're focusing on pumps, heat exchangers, core design, uh, fission products, extraction, all these things we talked about. We're not focusing on how to uh, build uh, steam turbines or boilers or anything like that. So what we're delivering is really just the heat out of the reactor uh, as a hot salt. And then we sell that by the megawatt hour or kilowatt hour to customers. Um, and uh, it's uh, up to them then to convert that to something useful. But we're sort of agnostic in how the energy is used. So yeah, there's not a steam uh, turbine inside the container. There's a question about how realistic is 2028, a uh, chance of a delay. Uh, so many of you who followed the, this uh, molten salt um, reactor industry in the past 10 years will know that it didn't move very fast. And the main reason for that is, of course, a lack of money. Uh, we believe, or at least what we have experienced in the last five years, is that there's been a, a, a really... Uh, considerable amount of change in the public opinion towards nuclear and especially towards thorium molten salt reactors. And we believe that there, this is going to shift even more. There's a lot of people now who are starting to realize that if we're going to, to change away from fossil fuels, uh, you know, wind and solar is not going to do it alone. We need something else. And, and then they have the chance of uh, you know, putting more money into classical nuclear or putting more money into new types of nuclear. And, um, uh, you know, we do expect that there will be a lot more interest in this field in the next 10 years, that we will see a rapid growth, both in the amount of money being available, but also the number of people working in the field. Um, and that by itself will help. Um, but I would also say that, um, you know, if it depends a little bit on the politicians because they can put up so many rules and regulations and difficult tests and requirements that it will take, you know, more than 10 years, 20 years to build a reactor. It's easily, it's very easy to put up all these roadblocks, but it's also possible to make it realistic and get something up and running. And we've seen back in the 50s and 60s when they, they didn't know all the physics we know today. They didn't have all the computers to do simulations. They didn't have CNC milling and all these nice things. And they still then, they were able to build reactors in one or two or sometimes three years for a completely new uh, type of reactors and get them up and running. And some of those reactors that they built in one year they actually ran for 25 years without any problems or accidents. So we know from physics and math and engineering that we can easily build something quickly if we want to as humans. But of course, we can also make it really difficult. We just need to uh, put a lot of lawyers, uh, get those involved, then we can slow things down as much as we want. I think there's an important question here. Um, Thank you for the presentation, but I was wondering why Copenhagen Thomas decided to give the reactor the name Waste Burner. Why not Thorium Molten Salt Reactor? Hmm. Uh, well, I, I would say the general term uh, Molten Salt Reactor is a class of reactors, and there's actually um, a lot of um, different designs in that uh, class. Uh, and then a subclass of that is uh, Thorium based Molten Salt Reactors. And there's also a number of different designs in that class. Uh, and and we, we had to give our reactor a name. And in the nuclear industry, it seems that everything is called LWR, PWR, EMSR, or whatever. Uh, and we, we didn't like that so much. So we wanted to give it a, a, a name that people kind of understood. And we think it's a really important message because if you go out on the street and ask people, the majority of the population doesn't know that you can actually do something about nuclear waste most of the population, including most of the politicians, they say that, ah, oh, but this is a big problem and it cannot be solved, which is not entirely true. So, so that's also part of the reason we chose that name is, is to 
to get that in, uh, discussion on the agenda. And I also see sort of two similar questions here. Uh, one about uh, Alpha Laval and using a existing hermetic pump and also why not use a component from the CSP that's uh, solar, uh, concentrated solar power plants. Um, and so it's true that uh, molten, uh, sorry, um, concentrated solar power uses uh, molten salts, but it's these uh, nitrate salts uh, which would uh, decompose under radiation. And they're also limited in temperature. Uh, so there's several reasons that you wouldn't use them for a nuclear salt in a nuclear reactor. Um, but that also means that uh, those standard components have different specification than what you have for a molten salt reactor. And Thomas also mentioned that in the MSRE, they had this uh, pump that they weren't completely satisfied with. And that was a cantilever type pump where you have a motor at the top and then a pump all down in the salt and then you have a shaft connecting them. And that means you'd have to have a dynamic seal that uh, separates the uh, salt from uh, the surrounding. And that failed for different reasons. And um, that's also what's used in CSP, but it has some inherent problems. And main problem is certifying a dynamic seal for an approval agency to not only for an approval agency, but also for yourself to make sure that that will never leak. And we saw that as a big challenge. And that's also why you can't use components off the shelf is because they don't, they're not intended to operate with 700 degrees um, uh, fuel salt with fission products in them. So we uh, went completely back to the drawing board and designed what's called uh, active electromagnetic um, pump. It's a can pump. So the whole um, pump is in the hot zone and it's uh, circulating the molten salt without any seals at all, as Thomas said. So um, a lot of these things are similar to what exists in industry, but you need to uh, think, rethink the components and systems for working with molten salts. And that's sort of what we've been doing the last five years and will continue to do uh, for many years to come. It's to improve existing concepts, to work with molten salts and to be uh, scalable and cheap to manufacture. And there's a, qu a question about uh, the fuel salt. Uh, what is the reason for choosing lithium fluoride, thorium fluoride as fuel rather than something else, for example, uh, sodium fluoride, zirconium fluoride, thorium fluoride, equivalent to the aircraft reactor experiment? Um, I can also quickly answer that. So the, uh, there was also a question about whether we could have our molten salt reactors in planes in the future. And while that could be possible, it's, there's no reason to do it. Uh, pl planes work uh, great on liquid fuels already. Um, and the molten salt reactor was of course invented for, for, by people who are looking to put a reactor on a plane. And there they used a, a sodium based salt, but you can't make a breeder with a sodium uh, based salt in the thermal spectrum. For that you need enriched uh, lithium seven. Um, and that's commercially available also for existing reactors. Um, not all the way up to the same amount of enrichment that we would maybe like uh, up to like 99.9 .9, and we would maybe like a couple more zeros on that or sorry nines on that um, but uh, we don't need that when when we're starting when we're testing chemistry and when we're testing a lot of other reactor principles and even uh, commercially available enriched lithium seven uh, can be used and then you just have uh, a little bit of neutron poison from the uh, the lithium seven um, or six sorry so it's, it's one of these things that we can iteratively approve along the way. We don't need to start out with the perfect uh, uh, components and the co perfect design. It's a iterative improvement process. I also just want to mention a little bit, that's part of our philosophy in Copenhagen Atomics is, uh, you know, you can make something really perfect. And there's, there's also other companies out there and other groups that are researching on uh, flyp salt. And it is true that FLYP has some really positive things about it, uh, but all our chemists in our lab are really, they don't want to work with FLYP. And the, part of the reason today we work with FLINAC, which is a, a fairly safe salt to work with. We can even have students, workers work on, on that. Uh, it's, yeah, it's cheap. Uh, that's that's some of the things we like when something is is readily av av uh, accessible and the same thing with the lithium fluoride thorium fluoride it's uh, readily available and it's not super dangerous to work with so we believe that in the beginning when you when you are still learning it's a good salt to start on and then later on once you've been built 
one, two, three versions of your reactor. If you can see that you can improve your efficiency by some percent by changing over to FLYP, then maybe that is the right time to do that. Uh, but right now, if we were to work on FLYP, it would make life a lot more difficult. And there's also another thing in Europe, it's really, really difficult to get approvals for a lab to work with beryllium. Uh, so why all that hassle if it's just improving uh, your, your design by a few percent right now? So it's not that we are against things like FLYP. We just think it's, it's not the right thing to start with it. it there's a similar comment to the same. The, so we're selling these molten salt loops and we've had a number of uh, universities and companies, uh, uh, you know, contact us and say, you know, can you build the same thing in Hasloy N or some uh, nickel alloy, whether in canal or something. And we can do that. And we actually, at one point, we, we got the quotes, quotes from sub suppliers to build everything out of in canal. And it turned out in the end, simply because there's much less suppliers and you, you can't get the same things, it would end up being 10 times more expensive. And then, of course, the, the potential customer said, oh, but I, I don't want to pay 10 times as much for it. And that's the reality we live in. If you want to use something really simple like stainless steel 316, you can, give it, you can almost get it down in the local corner uh, shop. And it, it's, for example, we work here at a big factory where they have lots of stainless steel. So we can go right out on the on the stacks and, and get it. Uh, we don't even have to order it. It makes life a lot easier. And this is good enough for running the tests that we run now up to one year. It's, a, it's just a question of controlling your redox potential and making sure you have clean salts. Then stainless steel 316 is actually a really good uh, uh, metal. There are a couple of questions about uh, competitors and uh, uh, other companies working on this technology and countries. Uh, one is who are the competitors and what is the status of development of competitors and also one about China is developing the, this technology. Will will the winner take it all or are there room for more players? I, I will try to answer that. Um, we welcome as many uh, competitors as possible. We think that in order to get this industry off the ground and get enough people working in this industry and to get uh, recognized by the general public, we think it's important that as many people try to push this forward as possible, both in universities, but also in, in companies. And we actually think that part of the reason that we now see the US and Canada moving uh, on this, you know, 10 years ago, nothing was happening in, in terms of funding from the U.S. towards molten salt research. But now there, something is happening. And part of that reason is firstly because uh, China started to move forward, but also because there was a, a number of startup companies and a community of people and engineers who were interested in this field. Uh, and I think the more people we can get involved across the world, uh, the more money we can get to this field. And also I think Competition is a good thing. I mean, it makes us everybody, uh, you know, uh, more agile and moving forward. And for us in Copenhagen Atomics, of course, we have the chance to sell uh, our services and our components to those uh, other companies that wants to work in molten salt. So we, we see that as a basically a customer base. But I, I would say to that also, in several cases, we have made joint applications with uh, universities where we... we um, apply for uh, research grants together with the university and where we, uh, in, instead of selling a loop to them, for example, we, we supply some of our services and our components as part of that research project. So that, that is also something that we hope we can see a lot more uh, happening across the world. And especially in Europe, I want much more of this in Europe, but it's a, uh, Europe is, uh, is in some ways lacking a, a behind in terms of the funding, uh, but, I'm really proud to say that sometimes when I visit people in Asia or especially in the US, they, we talk about the pump that we've developed in Copenhagen Atomics and also the, the heat exchangers we're testing for Alpha Laval. And they say, you know, we never believed or we never thought that, uh, that the mo two most critical components would come from Europe and you would be leading the development of those components. We thought it would be, yeah, in the US or something. And we, we should be proud of that in Europe that we, that we are in some ways leading uh, part of the development in molten salt reactor and also the, the guys in Petten are doing some really important work uh, towards this. So I think we, in Europe, we need to come together and, uh, and actually uh, get more funding and build this into a bigger industry in Europe. Uh, there is a question about uh, 
the smaller the reactor, the more neutron loss occurs. Are you sure that your one megawatt thorium reactor will sustain itself? Uh, yeah. Uh, so you have to remember that when you make a reactor that's critical, you can you can sort of make it to be critical at any output. You can think of a bomb, a nuclear bomb. Let's say a tiny reactor that's very super critical. Uh, when they started the MSRE, it was running on 10 watts for the first couple of days while they're doing criticality tests. Um, so you, you have to uh, assemble something that's critical. Now, if the question is talking about whether we can sustain a prolonged critical chain reaction due to fission buildup or whether we can create a breeder. The first one megawatt reactor is not intended to do either of those. It's intended to test the whole system, the operations, the components, the corrosion associated with a fissioning salt and fission products. Um, and uh, you do have a large neutron loss if you have a small reactors, but we also have some ideas how to get around that uh, that we're not sharing yet. There's a question about our financial figures and uh, and our capital st uh, capital structure. Uh, so so Copenhagen Atomics is incorporated in Denmark, and uh, and now we are allowing normal people to invest uh, in our startup through Funderbeam. And the way it works on Funderbeam is that um, people invest. Uh, they can even use their credit card to invest an amount on Funderbeam, and then once the whole uh, fundraising campaign is closed then we look at how many uh, how much money is, has been collected and then uh, that an amount of shares is then issued as new shares in Copenhagen Atomics uh, and then this uh, SP, uh, co uh, found, Funder Beam is setting up what's called a special purpose vehicle SPV uh, to hold those shares and then the people who invested through Funder Beam then uh, is assigned a digital certificate that they own that amount of shares in that in that structure, um, and then later on, if they want to sell their shares, they can sell them uh, to other um, uh, members or people who have an account on Funderbeam. Uh, and eventually, there's uh, likely going to be more investment rounds, uh, maybe even before we take the the company public on an IPO. Uh, so there will be chances to uh, to buy and sell uh, shares also later on. Um, it's um, so, so basically, the the Funderbeam is a is a one big shareholder in in company Copenhagen Atomics, and we would like to um, to have a company where we have a lot of uh, people from the public invest because it uh, it shows the rest of the public and also the politicians that this is not something that a few rich guys uh, are playing around with. It's something that has a broad uh, public appeal. Um, I hope that sort of answers the question. There is a question about the radiation level of a 100 megawatt system and how is it isolated from the environment? I think Sam has also mentioned that we plan to have it underground. So the, we have a few people who are confused about our illustration uh, of the container in a hall being built. But it's, uh, it's similar to uh, if you have a picture of an aircraft being built, you don't expect it to fly in there. Um, so yeah, there, there is a shielding and there is a fence and there's uh, all the normal uh, security issues around radiation protection and source term to the environment. There's a few questions here. Uh, there's a question, is it possible to ramp up this technology uh, when you need a lot of plutonium or uranium-235. Um, well, um, you could say today uh, there's a certain um, enrichment capacity in the world of, uh, for, cap for enriching uranium-235, um, but it's known technology, and of course we could scale that up as, as humans if we wanted to. Uh, the problem with the enrichment is that it's not only a, a, an engineering problem, it's also a proliferation problem, it's a political problem, it's an international treaty problem, and once you get lawyers involved, you know, maybe it cannot be done that fast, but you know, in theory it, it could be scaled up. Uh, and there is a lot of uranium in the world, so it's not likely that we would run out of uranium just around the corner. Uh, with respect to plutonium, uh, plutonium is not found in nature, so there's a limited amount of plutonium on this planet is only what we humans have produced in the last less than 100 years. Um, there's roughly 3,000 tons of plutonium in the spent nuclear fuel around in the world. And 
there's a lot of debate uh, in this uh, in these cycles whether uh, we will get paid to take that and and dispose of it or whether we have to pay for it to take it and dispose it uh, and i think in the beginning we would get paid to take it but you know when we get closer to a, a point where we've used all the 3000 tons of plutonium then we would maybe have to pay for it uh, but that's still open for debate and you can certainly start a lot of reactors on 3000 tons of plutonium in thermal spectrum uh, and also you have to remind yourself that that at some point we hope to get to a level where we have breeder reactors that produces more uranium-233 than they consume. So eventually uh, we would use that as a Kickstarter fuel. Um, I hope that answers that question. I'll just uh, add a little bit onto that. It's actually, if you look at the math, um, fast spectrum reactors also have a very good breeding ratio, but they have a terrible fissile inventory to power output. That means that you need a lot more fissile fuel to start the same amount of thermal power in a fast spectrum reactor. And if you go through and assume that you can get a, even a really large fraction of the plutonium that exists in spent fuel or even some of the uh, weapons grade plutonium or uranium, and you try and go through the math of a fast spectrum reactor and scale to world energy production or a fraction of like 20%, uh, they become fairly limited simply by the amount of material they need, even though they're good breeders. Uh, and even if you make a lesser breeding ratio in a thermal spectrum, because they need so much less fissile material to start, you can ramp up to global energy demand much quicker. Um, there's also a question whether it would be a good idea to uh, to do the first steps uh, together with European partners, uh, such as the Netherlands, instead of doing it alone. Um, and we certainly certainly want uh, wants to do that. That's again also part why we were part of the Mimosa application back in 2016, and and uh, we've been to the Netherlands many times since then, and uh, and we have a very good dialogue with the people who work with molten salts in the, in the Netherlands, uh, and we would like to see more happening. Um, we we now have a number of investors from different European countries, and there's. Um, um, we're talking about setting up uh, maybe um, some um, research uh, department or, or setting up a sister company or in some other way uh, doing research also outside of Denmark in other European countries and potentially even also uh, in the United States. Uh, so right now we are exploring those uh, possibilities and I, I cannot say exactly where we will end, but I, I find it unlikely that that Copenhagen Atomics will only be working in Denmark in two years from now. Uh, I, I think we will, yeah, work, for example, in the Netherlands. Okay, I suggest uh, one more question and then um, wrap it up. Is that sound, does that sound okay? Okay, is there one more question? Yes. Yeah, I, I would like to answer the one, where do you expect to mine the thorium? Uh, because it, it's a really easy answer and it, it it's part of the things that I should have said in my presentation, but I think I forgot. So already today, when we mine for other materials, we already get enough thorium out of the ground in those existing mines, the enough thorium that we could power the entire humanity with thorium. So, so there's no need to do new mining. Um, but I would say though, that a lot of that thorium is uh, mined in, in mining operations inside China. So China mines much more than half of that. And also a lot of times when you get thorium out of the ground, it's in rare earth mines. And also even outside of China, China owns a lot of those, those mines. And that has been a lot of debate uh, in the past and that continues also that um, mm, there's a number of people who doesn't like that, that, uh, you, uh, that China has such a big impact on those type of mines where they make thorium. But we have to remind ourselves that there are thorium in all the countries of the world. Uh, and, um, and there's also quite a lot of mines where we get thorium out of the ground that is not owned by China. So I don't, you know, I don't see that we will run out of thorium anytime soon. We already, the processes for refining the thorium uh, is already well known. So it's not a big, it's not a big issue to get thorium. Uh, and there's already suppliers where we can buy thorium today uh, internationally. Um, we have, uh, yeah. So I don't think this will be a big issue, but, it, but I, I do think actually for the rare earth production that it would be a good idea that there would be 
more countries uh, in addition to China that can supply all, all these different rare earth materials. And if, if that happened, then we would also have a lot more thorium mining all over the world. Yes, I would like to add a little thing to that. Um, that's actually the case that in the case of uh, uh, mining for rare earth materials, that uh, thorium in the Western countries is, is one of the showstoppers for um, mining uh, rare earth materials. Because when you dig up er rare earth materials, rare earth ores, the better ores are always rich in thorium. And it creates a liability for the mining, op for the mining companies. So there's really a very uh, nice uh, circularity circularity uh, story, to be, story to be told about it. And there's definitely a subject I would like to go into in one of our future uh, meet and greets. And I think uh, several people around the world have very interesting things to say about that. Um, Thomas, can you put up my final, sl final slide? That's the one. Yes, very good. Mm -hmm. Um, so I want to thank all the attendees. I saw, I think, about uh, 77 uh, attendees uh, at the maximum, something like that. So it uh, means uh, the, the webinar was very well visited. I hope you all ha had a, just as good a time as I had. Uh, I thought it was a very interesting presentation, and I'm uh, looking very much forward, uh, very much looking forward to your further developments and uh, further innovations. And uh, wish you all the luck. Thank you for. Uh, Telling it. Thank you very much for everyone joining and, and also the you're hosting it from for uh, MSR Foundation. <laughs> yes, really an international operation. So um, <laughs> if you if you start a broadcast, then we can uh, just have a little chat afterward. Yes. Yeah. Thank you all for joining. <laughs>